Thank you for clicking. My name is Mark Mitchell. I'm a mortgage broker here in London, Ontario. In light of the release of the federal budget last month, where the government announced it would be increasing social spending um, as a means of getting us through the, the, the rest of the COVID pandemic, um, in conjunction with this, the spending that the government did last year throughout 2020, again, to help get us through the pandemic, a lot of commentators have been worried about the, the possibility that inflation will go up to the point that it did in the 1980s, uh, which will lead to higher interest rates, again, much to like we saw in the, like, in the 1980s and uh, 1990s. So at its height, in the early 1980s, interest rates actually hit 21.46%. That's quite a bit compared to the low 2% rates, uh, mid 1% rates that we've actually been seeing. Um, in London and in the rest of the areas of the country. So a lot of people have been worried that inflation will go up to the, to the extent that the Bank of Canada has to raise interest rates as a means to fight that inflation and cool down their economy. If we take that, and you know, there is good reason to be worried. If we take that 21.46% uh, that interest rate that we saw in the early 80s and apply it to the average house in London, Ontario, well, we can see what happens to the payments. Right now, using an interest rate of 1.83, the average house in London, uh, the payments are going to be right around $2,600 per month. If we add that 21.46% interest rate, payments go up to um, a little over $11,000. Obviously, that's not something most families can afford, so it's, it's definitely worth consideration whether or not we can expect to see inflation go that high and whether or not the rates will go that, that high in order to, to combat that inflation. So in this video, I want to briefly go over the oil shocks, the subsequent uh, increase in wage demands, as well as Canada's uh, overall budget and government spending as a means for comparing the 1980s and 1990s, uh, huge large interest rates that we saw, particularly in the 1980s, and the current period, as Canada's obviously been spending quite a bit of money on COVID and on the social spending and keeping the, the country going. Um, so a comparison of those three factors over the, the 80s, 90s, and right now should give us at least a fairly good idea as to whether or not we can expect to see similar rise in interest rates in that 10-20% uh, mar uh, margins that we saw in the 80s and the 90s. So in order to understand the inflation that, that came about in the 1980s, uh, hitting its peak of about 12% in 1982, we have to go back about 10 years when we saw the, the creation of the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC as it's commonly known. What happened very briefly was that a number of oil producing countries grouped together, formed a cartel, and actually uh, institute an embargo on oil towards the West. So the West couldn't get any oil, or not nearly as much oil as, they, they, as they'd been accustomed to. As a result, prices on oil shot through the roof. Then, uh, about five years later, in 1978, there was a revolution in Iran, and they instituted an uh, oil production cut, which also helped shoot the price of oil up through the roof. So we have these two forces in the 70s, both increasing the, the cost of the West's oil, of Canada's oil, and that of the United States. We use oil for everything. We use it for plastics, we use it for transportation. Um, it creates a lot of jobs. But when the cost of that input gets factored in, well, the cost of everything is going to go up. So the cost of everything really started going up, which is inflation. When inflation starts to, starts to go up, then those workers and everybody and basically the whole population also want to see their wages go up in basically a one-to-one -one fashion so that they can afford the new price of these goods. Well, the labor unions back in the early 1980s were much, much stronger than they are now, for better or for worse, but they did have a lot more, a lot more power. So we had not only oil prices going up, we also had labor prices going up which in order to pay for the to, to compensate for the growing inflation which just created more inflation and it was sort of a self-reinforcing um, self-reinforcing process uh, which caused massive massive inflation 
um, again, meeting, uh, hitting around 12%, 13% in the very early 80s, when the government really wants to hit about 2% inflation, that's its target rate. So, of course, they did have to raise the interest rates massively to cool down that, that inflation. I mean, it's, it's no surprise that the, the highest interest rate came on the year with the highest inflation in the 1980s. Do we have anything like that now? Not, no. No, not really. Uh, yes, the government has been spending money, and we're gonna, we are going to get to that. So there's not really, there's no real exogenous shocks, any external factors, big hits to our system, at least yet, that could cause a massive runaway in inflation in the same manner that it did in the in the 1980s when rates were at that 20 20 percent that that we keep hearing about from, I mean, justifiably wor worried commentators. But. Just OPEC and just oil prices were not the only reason for, for the inflation. The last and final big reason for inflation, or for the, the large interest rates really, are the, were the policies of the government and the Bank of Canada. So, our finances throughout the 1980s and really up until 1996 uh, compared to the rest of the developed world, or the West, the, the, the G7, uh, we had one of the highest GDP ratios. That is, our overall economic output, output compared with how much debt we're in. So how much, produ how much we produce versus how much we owe. So if we look throughout the, the 80s, it was one of the highest, highest, uh, highest countries in, in terms of debt to GDP ratio. So we were seen as a much riskier, a riskier borrower. And you know, same with the way that when, same with, um, in the same manner as when you go to get a mortgage and you're seen as a higher, uh, a riskier borrower, you have to pay a higher interest rate to borrow money. Well, the same with Canada. We had to pay a higher interest rate to, in order for us to borrow money. So when we have to pay a higher interest rate as a country as a whole, you have to pay a higher interest rate. Fast forward to now how does it yes obviously the government has spent a whole lot of money um, throughout 2020 and 2021 and probably well into the future so how do we compare now uh, will we see the same sort of are we seen just as risky well the key thing to remember as to whether or not we're seen as risky as is compared to what we have to be, compare ourselves to the rest of the g7 G8 uh, country, well, there is no G8. So we have to compare ourselves to the rest of the G7 countries and see how risky do we look compared to them. Because when we say something is something, we're also saying what it's not. So when we look, whereas in the 1980s, Canada's uh, debt to GDP ratio was amongst the highest. If we look at the, at the chart here, we can see that even with our pandemic spending, and we have we have spent more on the pandemic than any other per cap on a per capita basis, more than any other of the G7 companies or countries, we still are right in that range. We're not we don't see as big of, as big of spread as the rest of the countries as we did in the 1980s. So even though yet yeah, we've spent a lot of money, are we are we considered risky compared to the other big investment centers? Not a whole lot, not not really. In fact, it was only a week or two ago that we've uh, that S and P re upgraded our credit rating. So whereas in the eighties we in the in the early nineties, lending money to Canada was seen as very risky, and we had to pay more to borrow. Well, it's not seen as risky as, as it was right in the eighties or the nineties. So. We've gone over the oil shocks, the subsequent inflation, and the subsequent uh, government funding that, or uh, government budgetary problems that we had in the 80s and the 90s, which caused the, the high inflation and also caused the high interest rates that we saw, the 21.46%. Those factors that we saw in the 80s and the 90s aren't really present right now. That's not to say that rates won't go up. That's not to say that rates won't go up to 20%. I doubt they will, but that's not to say that they won't. Anything can happen, and there could be some sort of um, exogenous shock, something external to Canada to cause rates to go up um, uh, big time. But 
uh, or because you know we we didn't see nobody foresaw the formation of OPEC that nobody saw that coming, so something could always happen. But all things being equal, when we look at our circumstances right now, and we look at our circumstances in the '80s, between what's around us and what's going on within Canada compared to everybody else, it's night and day. There's there. It, they, yes, the government is spending a lot of money, but we have to consider in context of everybody else, of all the countries in the world, and our entire budget. And as the uh, the IMF data t shows, our debt to GDP ratio is set to go down um, in the in the coming years, and the IMF definitely keeps keeps an eye on everybody's on everybody's uh, finances fa fairly closely. If you like this video, please do click like and subscribe. And uh, we'll have more updates and more analysis on the mortgage and the real estate market and, of course, interest rates as time goes on. Thank you.